Thanks for listening to another life-transforming message from the team here at C3 Southwest Washington. To find out more about our church, visit c3swwa.com. Today, I am really fortunate to continue on with our series entitled Jesus People. Um, With that, um, I'm going to have to hand this to production and they'll have to reset it. I don't know why. I must do something to mess it up, Steve. It's in a different mode. Um, uh, during the season, uh, during this series, we're focusing on who Jesus is and the impact he has on people that he meets, as well as the impact that he wants to have on each of our lives. And so today, I've actually chosen a portion of scripture that's fairly unusual, or at least it's hard to put this into your world as if it's got an application, but I think it does have a great application. Luke 8, 30, it says, Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion. Well, if only I could have like that Dracula music playing in the background. Legion, for many demons had entered this man. If you're a visitor, we don't talk about this every week, I can assure you. But it's worthwhile talking about because it's prevalent in Scripture. I just want to talk to you today about the idea of the man whose name was Legion. Thank you, sir. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Bless your people with your word. Father, this this account and many like it are in Scripture for good purpose. There's a reason. We don't just want to throw stuff out and say, well, that was for then. There's an application today that we need to be aware of. I pray, Lord, that you give us clarity and understanding. Lord, you have uh, uh, each person in this room is impacted to some degree by this story on a regular basis. And so, Lord, I pray for the revelation, and the revelation allows us to walk better as we follow after you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand before you're seated, all right? (laughs) Buckle up, because we're going to talk about some things. And that are pertaining to spirits and demons. And again, we don't talk about this every week, but I'm not going to hedge around the portion of Scripture. It's a fascinating piece of Scripture that takes place here in the book of Luke, chapter 8. And as we take a look at this, I'm not going to dive into all of the account because there's some unusual things that happen in this story that don't always happen in stories like this that just, they're not a distraction, but there's not an application for today. Uh, Looking at the book of Luke, chapter 8, let's just jump into the story and notice a couple things as we go. It says, this is Jesus and the disciples. It says, then they sailed to the country of the Gerizines. Maybe your version of the Bible says Gadara or the Gadarenes. This is a place uh, where this, this man is known as the man from Gadara, from his town. And it says it was on the opposite side of the lake as Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, out of his boat onto land, notice this, there met him a man from the city who had demons. So first thing I want you to notice in this portion of scripture is that when Jesus steps onto a topographical piece of ground, territory, there is not a fisticuffs, there is not a, a, um, a uh, 1970 demon movie with a girl whose head spins and pea soup is being sprayed out of her mouth all over the place. There is not a battle of angels and demons and it's 50-50 and who will win this? Jesus steps onto this ground and the man who is demon possessed immediately comes and bows down at his feet. The reason why that is so important is we get so intimidated by the enemy's strength that we make him so much larger than he is, and we imagine that somehow that we've got to be, you know, the incredible Hulk to battle through and to win against the wicked one, when in reality, just the presence of Jesus alone demands that the demonic bow down at his feet. Anybody excited about that? You should better be excited about that because in the unseen world around you, there is demonic activity. And the only reason why we see this demon manifested is because the presence of God shows up. 
That's the reality. That's one of the key things that I want you to know. When we prayed this morning for your arrival, we prayed according to our mission as a church family. Our mission isn't to have church services. Our mission isn't to raise money or have buildings. That all helps and is part of what we do. But our mission, our literally our mission every time we gather is to make sure that the presence of God is here so that as you step into the gathering, whatever you need is available. Because where God is, where God's presence is, every need can be met. And he, come on, help me out here today right? You know, the thing is, if we gather and God's presence is not here, we're no different than the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or Cupcakes or the, the, the motorcycle team. All those teams are probably great. All those gatherings are wonderful. But the one thing that should make us absolutely different is when you walk into this place, you can sense there is something's, something's in here. There's, oh, I don't know, why is, my, why is the hair standing up on my arms? I don't know. It's my reaction to there's something's in here. And it's tangible experience with the presence of God. And that's our expectation that when you walk in here, you experience that because the Spirit of God dwells within us. And that's the thing that makes this gathering different and should make every church gathering different. And when God is present, things that are wrong, things that are evil, things that are out of the will of God have to come and bow down and submit immediately to the presence of God. You know, I value good preaching, I value good doctrine, I value good experiences, I love to laugh, I love to do crazy things. Go ride with me out in the woods, and at some point, I'm going to kick on my stereo, don't judge me, kick on Purple Rain, and do an air guitar solo for everybody that I'm riding with. Why do you do that? I don't know. I just love to have fun. But at the end of the day, the thing that we have to be all about is the presence of God in our gatherings. It doesn't happen automatic. I know the Bible says where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them. But sometimes when the two or three gathered, he's in the jar in their heart dormant. And so when they gather, no one experiences the presence of God. God is experienced when it's intentional. Now, sometimes God will just break out on his people, but so often we can bring the invitation in. You had an impact on the presence of God today. By your posture, by your actions, your willingness to sing or unwillingness to sing. You're leaning in and saying, come on, God, I know you have things for my life and for other people. Your posture invites the presence of God. Or it can actually kind of repel it a little bit. But I'm just of the opinion, because of my posture, because of Pastor Rowena's posture, our leader's posture, that if you're leaning back like this, you're still going to experience the presence of God because we bring enough of the presence of God to blow through your resistance. You don't have a choice. You're going to experience God. Anybody here with me today? Okay. So notice this. This junk that we see about this wrestling that takes place when the demonic is around, I want to tell you, it doesn't need to be that way. Because of the presence of God, this is how the demonic should respond. Now, it says, when he stepped out and land, the man uh, met him from the city who had demons for a long time. I mean, notice what demonic activity will draw out of your life. It's not good. Admittedly, this is an extreme case. There are a lot of other accounts that are mentioned in the Bible and we'll get to a few of them, but Jesus literally, the only thing is he casts them out with a single word. There's no attention drawn to what they're doing. There's no wrestle. Again, it's, this is a little bit more uh, larger because there's some things that we can learn from this, but this is the most extreme that it gets. Now, this man, he had experienced this self-sabotaging behavior because he was possessed by demons. It says he wore no clothes. For he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. And let me tell you, that's where demonic activity will take you, to live in, a pre in the presence of death, not the presence of life. Next slide, uh, verse eight, or chapter 8, verse 28. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you. Notice. The demon begs Jesus. Jesus doesn't beg the demon. No prolonged discussion with this demon. The demon begs him, but he says, do not torment me. The, the demon wasn't tormenting Jesus. He was worried about Jesus tormenting him. And he goes on to say, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. 
Next verse is, Jesus then asked him, what is your name? This is the only account where Jesus asked this, but it's interesting. A lot of people think he's talking to the demon. He actually asked the man, what is your name? And the man says, legion, for many demons had entered him. It's not the demon talking at this point. It's the man responding. And this is one of the sad things about the enemy's work in our life. It actually wants to name you. It wants to call you by the name. It wants to, your, your new name is not your name. Your new name the enemy wants to give you is the affliction that he's put upon you. I am a drug addict. I am an alcoholic. I am divorced. I am fill in the blank. All of us have had something that the enemy has worked in our lives and wants to make that our identity, but I assure you, Jesus wants to free you of that false identity because he called you into existence, he named you by name, and the name that he has over your life is not legion. It's the goodness of God. The banner over us is his love. So he asks, what is your name? And he says, legion. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. See, these demons got a little confused about the timetable. They thought this is the end, and we're about to be cast into the lake of fire. And then some things happened from there, but ultimately Jesus cast these demons out of the man. Verse number 35, then people went out to see what had happened. This guy had quite the reputation, and they heard that something had transpired, so they go out to see him. And they came to Jesus and found the man for him whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Let me just stop there and say there's no better place for you to live your life than at the feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I mean, when he calls you to follow, stay close, watch what he's doing, don't get distracted, let him lead you, let him guide you, live there at his feet. He's got great things for your life. And so this man is exactly where he needed to be. Oh, and he's clothed and in his right mind. And that actually scared people. You know, the proof of God at work in your life is not that you start just going to church. It's not that you just start reading your Bible. There is a visible transformation of your life before people's eyes. Jesus transforms people. He doesn't just forgive them, and it would be enough if that's all he did. But the proof of God's work, God at work in your life, is you being transformed. In this case, it happens instantly, but it's not the only moment of transformation in his life or any one of our lives. And it's inspiring to a lot of people in the crowd, but believe it or not, there will be some people in your world that as you grow in God, they will not be pleased. Your presence in their life and you being transformed by God makes them to have to recognize that there's not the same thing going on in their life, and it creates a rub and creates a tension. So understand, as you begin to pursue God, not everybody's going to be standing on the side cheering your name going to be some people close in your world who cannot deny the good things going on and yet are going to have strong negative feelings towards you because of God at work. I just would say all of heaven's cheering you on, okay? Heaven is cheering for you every step you take. We're cheering for you every step you take. Ignore the dissenters. They're going to be there. Anybody? Like, got any dissenters in your world? Somebody not so excited. I had a friend say to me about three weeks after I got saved, you know, I like the old Steve. Ooh. You know what? I looked at him and said, I can't stand that guy. I'm glad he's dead. He was dead. Buried with Jesus and raised to new life. It's the new Steve. And he still needs some perfection, but the old one definitely was gone. So, and those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been It's interesting, this word right here. The demon-possessed man was what? Healed. Healed. It's a fascinating combination, healing and the demon possession. He was was clean, but the word there used is healing. We'll talk about it some more in a few minutes. Then all the people of the surrounding country and of the Gerasenes asked him to, to depart, for they were seized with great fear, so he got into the boat and returned. Next slide, final verses. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with Jesus. This is strange, but it makes sense. He wanted to go with Jesus. I mean, after all, Jesus had done so much for him, but the will of God for him was different than the 12 disciples. God had a specific plan for him, and God 
said, I want you to go back to where you're from and share what God, the many things that God has done for you, because that's where you will be the most powerful. Don't set your eyes on a position or a specific ministry and think to yourself, oh, if only I could do that, then I could really do something for God. Because you might actually aspire for something that's not even in your gift set, and you will spend 20, 30, 40 years trying to perform a task, accomplish a, a mission that you've decided to engage in that you'll never be successful at because you, you, you're not pursuing the thing God has for you. Admire other people, but you find your lane and you drive hard in it, okay? You drive right into it, and you might stumble around, but you, you'll figure it out, and the people in your life who are leaders will help you to go in the proper direction, and you will, str- you will thrive in the lane that God has for you. Okay, so with that, let's talk a little bit about theology. I'm just going to give you a bunch of random facts about demons, if this is okay. Theology is the study of the Bible. I want you to picture the Bible like a great big box of puzzle pieces that tell a story. And if you're like me, it's really hard to see the picture looking into that box. And every verse is another puzzle piece. And if you want to think in terms of theology to understand what the Bible says, theology reaches into the box and grabs the puzzle pieces that are similar and puts them together. Like, if you're like me, the first thing I do, I grab, I look for all the edge pieces in a puzzle to make the frame, right? And so if it's a frame, the picture on the front of the box is all about like a scenery, but there's a fire engine in the background. I begin to grab all of the red pieces, digging through the box, get them over here, and what do we do? We build the fire engine in the spot where it should be. So theology works the same way. A lot of times when you're reading the Bible, you are just grabbing onto all sorts of puzzle pieces and not, you know, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Now it's talking about the devil. It's talking about sin. It's talking about temptation. How does this all fit together? Well, I'm re- going to reach in and grab all the demon pieces really quick so that you can see what the demon looks like. Not, li- not literally, okay? Does that make sense? Theology does that. You could study the theology or the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And that would be to reach into the, into the box of the Bible and take all the, all the pieces that talk about the Holy Spirit, put them in a pile, and then list them out in a systematic way so that you can understand the Holy Spirit. You could do the same thing with angelology or demonology, and that is some of what I've done for you today. And of course, always the notes are online. You can grab them. Uh, let me just hit you with a couple of things uh, about that. Now, before I jump into a couple of the specifics, um, the New Testament is filled with healing and casting out demons. But many modern church experiences lack either. A lot of people experience a passive church lifestyle. They come in and they give their life to Jesus, but that seems to be the end game. And so once their sins are forgiven, they say yes to Jesus, they begin to walk passively through life just assuming that wherever they wander to, that must be the will of God. And so that that really turns into a come into church and punch your, your time card, and I was a good boy today, and we'll see what tomorrow brings. And instead of being an aggressive fight for territory, there's a wandering through life to arrive wherever you arrive. The challenge with that is, there is there's no fight. There is no, hey, that's wrong. Let's, let's fight for what God has. There's no praying with aggression to see the enemy's hand, grasp over something released so that God's hand can be uh, pushed in and blessed. And the reason why in our modern day experience, I wouldn't say our church's experience, but modern day experience lacks for a lot of people a lack of the miraculous, lack of breakthrough, lack of breaking away from maybe something that's demonic in their life is just simply present, I call it presencelessness. It's a failure to fight to experience God's presence and therefore the things that are evil in our world are never agitated, never run our direction to be removed. In fact, I think the church being presenceless or powerless just allows some of this demonic activity to just latch on and be a part of people's lives. May our church always be the type of church that when someone walks in experiencing either needing healing or demonic activity that's latched onto their life, that's doing something, that the moment they come in, they experience the presence of God, and there's a, a shaking and a release from that demonic thing that's in their world. When they walk into the house of God, there's hope that this this sentence pronounced over me by my doctor that's going to be lifelong suddenly begins to shake and breaks off because God heals. 
That takes the presence of God. That takes the power of God. It's not passive Christianity. And I know that might make some people feel uncomfortable, but listen, it's worth it if you're sick to be healed, right? Okay, thank you, front rows. Come on back, Rose. Let's go. Um, I would also say that in our modern day, there's not a high emphasis placed because of all of that on discernment, not a high level uh, emphasis on faith. Do you know that you can have little faith and a lot of faith? You know, Jesus judged his disciples for a lack of faith. If this makes you uncomfortable, that I might be, might, be, might be suggesting that your faith is not what it needs to be, get over it because Jesus chewed his disciples out regularly. Now, your faith is not your love for God. Don't get confused. You can love God passionately and have faith that's like a thimble. You can. And these types of things bend in the presence of faith. They bend when there's power. They bend when there's authority. Think of our relationship with God twofold. There is loving Jesus, so important, but also walking in faith and power and authority to change the world that we live in. These two things need to work together, not one or the other. There's a bunch of people running around casting out demons, and Jesus says, depart from me because I don't even know who you are. They're so about faith, and they have no real relationship with God. The two things go together. I hope I can preach all of this in one message. We'll find out if we can, okay? Anyways, uh, let me just rattle some stuff off. Again, let me pick up a few puzzle, puzzle pieces, okay? You ready to go? You buckled up? There you go. Okay, spirits in the New Testament are often referred to as unclean spirits or impure spirits. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Also, the word spirit and demon are often used interchangeably, Matthew 8, 16. Satan is recognized as the leader of demons in Matthew chapter 9, verse 34. Now, this is not for sure, but we assume this, that spirits and demons are actually fallen angels who were kicked out of heaven with Satan, who started all there in the service of the Most High God. Uh, we read uh, in the book of Luke chapter 10, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jude 6 talks about the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority. And Revelation talks about the tail of the dragon sweeping a third of the stars out of the sky and flinging them to the earth. That's talking about spirits, angels, demons. So we assume that spirits, unclean, unclean spirits and demons are fallen angels. They are, not the, they are not people who have died previously, okay? In fact, let me say this, that people who talk to the dead are actually, this is where it gets really dangerous, perk up for a second, going to have your fortune told, going to have somebody read a crystal ball, reading your palms, they will come out with truths. The reason why they will come out with truths is not because they're talking to your dead ancestors. They are talking to the demonic who have been around since the beginning of time, who know facts and figures. And they will give you partial facts to intrigue you, to excite you. Oh, these are really real. Yes, they are really, really real liars and deceivers have come to enslave you, not set you free. Not to reveal the future, but to establish a track record of bondage to their authority. Okay? Let me give you this point. Demons can not only possess, but they can also oppress people. We see that in Mark chapter 5, verse 18. It talks about this, this account. The man was possessed with demons, but Matthew 4, 24 talks about Jesus setting free those who were oppressed by people. So there's the idea that the demonic can enter a person, but a demon can also push people. I call it push, nudge, and budge. It'll just bump into you, try to deter you off course, and then try to really push you at key moments or try to drag you away. In fact, even wrestle with you, even though you're not, not a physical wrestling that will take place uh, necessarily. Uh, let me say this. There's no biblical example, though, of a believer being possessed by a demon. I, and, I'll say, and I'll say this. I'll be very clear about my wording, being possessed by a demon. Yes, I've dealt with teenagers who have come to me and pretty sure they're demon-possessed, worried that they're demon-possessed. If you're worried about being demon-possessed, you probably aren't. Okay? Just your concern that you're demon-possessed. Uh, so, some have, I've gone so far in sin, I've committed the unpardonable sin. I've sinned against the blast. I blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. It's over for me. Just your concern about that is a good indicator that you haven't done that. Okay? Now, as I say that, 
believers still will wrestle with demons. Scripture teaches us in Ephesians, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God. So there's the reality while nothing can come in, the spirit of God lives within me. And scripture teaches that no, you know, a kingdom divided against itself will fall. I can't be filled with the spirit of God and have a demon inside of me, but I can certainly be pushed, nudged, and budged. I'll even go a step further. In my wrestle, if I submit myself to the enemy's work, I can actually surrender topography to him. This is something you have to be very careful about as a believer. When you and I submit ourselves to God, we actually, he owns the territory of our life. But when the enemy comes, he, he might not be able to get all of you, but he wants to take a portion of ground in your life. When you and I submit to his oppression, we actually say, okay, I, I guess you're going to be allowed to stand there in my life. Be careful about that. Recognize that you have authority in Jesus to own all of your territory, but when you step back and let him take territory, ooh, you're going to have to wrestle him. Once he, once he he's like, a, like some weeds. You pick him early, and the root, the root ball doesn't go down deep. You can get it out of there. But he will put his roots down deep, and the longer he stays there, he will entrench himself, and you will be battling all the time against this infectious cancer in your life. That's why you and I, we don't get involved with pornography. That is a cancer that will take a, a portion of your life and bring you captive. There's so many things that are addictive, and so many things, uh, another area would be unforgiveness. We're supposed to forgive people, but when we don't forgive people, the enemy comes in and stands on territory in our lives. And because he has territory in our life, it radically impacts us. You think, well, no, 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 it's, it doesn't affect anything, just that me and that person, and I don't ever have to see that person, so it's not affecting me. I can assure you that piece of ground that you have surrendered to the enemy by unforgiveness will, will, um, will destroy other moments in your life because of the infection that's there. And so don't give a foothold to the wicked one. Uh, uh, yes, okay. Um, there's no biblical example of a believer being possessed, but believers do wrestle against demons. Demons also, by, let me just, a little side note, many of the demons that Jesus kicked out were people who attended the synagogue and were faithful there. They were religious people, not followers of Jesus. Be a follower of Jesus, not just a church attender, Okay? Okay, did I already get this one? Believers can give the devil and demons a foothold. Well, I think I already preached that, didn't I? Uh, let me take you through a couple of those things. Um, believers can give the devil a foothold. It's right there in Ephesians. Um, 2 Corinthians says that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. That's strongholds even in believers' lives. When you surrender a piece of ground to the enemy, it becomes a stronghold. When you submit, here's one of the biggest strongholds that can take a hold of your life, fear. When we went through the pandemic, there's, there's, there's caution, wisdom, and then there's a nonsensical fear that can kick in. After a couple of years, there are still people who are terrified of some of the things that can happen. Now, there are a lot of dangers that are out there, and certainly COVID is not the only one, but regardless of what fear we are facing, the fear is an emotion. It is also an emotion that I refuse to submit to because I walk by faith. Now, for me, when we first heard about COVID, me and Rowena had a quick discussion, and I read in Scripture, this is for me, this is not for everybody, that Jesus in his time, the COVID of his day, was leprosy. And Jesus laid his hands on people who had leprosy. Does anybody see a problem with that? 
Like from the sense that how do you catch leprosy? By touching it. However, Jesus being called to heal confidently touches regardless of the concern. No doubt, maybe even some emotional fear. He pushes through the fear to touch the leper. And what happens? The leper is what? Healed. So me and Rowena had this conversation, and I had the conversation with the church. Do what you need to do. As for me, as for us, okay, come what may. And I've heard stories of pastors who have died and all sorts of things, lots of people. But for me, for us, for our family, I said, look, while there are serious concerns in this particular area, when the phone rings, we're going to go and lay hands on people and pray for them. Okay, that's just for me. Now, what could happen over time? Well, so I, went to, I called somebody up who needed prayer, and their response to me was, oh, no, 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 just pray over the phone. Don't come because I don't want you to get sick. And I do appreciate that that was their input. I do appreciate that was their suggestion. And I, I love that they care about me. However, there's a biblical formula for a lot of this to take place. And while certainly I would be concerned to get a disease, that I put myself in the presence of. However, there's a moment where I'm going to trust God. And I still wear my seatbelt when I drive my car. I wear a helmet when I'm riding out crazy man in the woods playing Purple Rain. I do, there's a lot of safety things that are great, and I participate in those safety things because they're reasonable, they make sense. But you understand, there's a lot of other ways I could fall off this platform on my head and die. And there are crazy fears that want to captivate us, and the enemy, one of his greatest forms of taking territory in our life is fear, where we're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Some of you, there's things that you, you deeply want to do that are actually dreams given to you by God, and yet you're terrified internally. And the enemy is just going to work that, ter- going to work that and work it and work it to back you into a corner so that you never experience the divine moment that God is part of which he's put you on this planet for. Almost every person who's effective in kingdom things, you ask them, did you experience fear? And every one of them will tell you, oh, yeah. Fear is an emotion. It's okay to experience fear, but to surrender to fear is a whole different issue. Amen? Okay, so believers can give the devil and demons a foothold. Um, I'd say this also, demonic activity saturates forms of false worship, religion, and idolatry. It would be valuable for you to consider your family. My background has some craziness. Family tree has some craziness. I'm not saying the immediate family tree, but go back some generations. Oh, historical note, parishes. Uh, I'm not sure if it wasn't parishes. It was on my mom's side of the family tree. Uh, We came over on the Mayflower, and our claim to fame is our relative fell off the boat, but they were able to get him back on. Not widely known. Look, we're not good at staying on the boat, but we're great at climbing back on. We don't give up. But in some of our past, in some of our history, there are various forms of worship and the occult. And that is one of the ways that some of this likes to tie in and grab a hold and and take territory in generations. And so Children can actually be born into homes where that territory has been established and generations can go by and there can be this this stronghold that's generational. Take a look at your family tree and ask yourself some questions and there might be the moment for you to look and say, I'm going to take authority over that. Listen, you, you might not need deliverance from an outside source. As a believer, you have everything within you to establish your own deliverance. Oh, man, I need to get people to pray. Do, good, do that. However, when you recognize in your family, every one of my relatives are divorced. But that's not the will of God, and that's not the plan of God for me. I denounce the things that have attached themselves to my family. They will end here. This is a new day. I am a new man. I submit myself to the authority of God. Divorce will not be a part of my story. Yeah. Now, along with your announcement, there will be some hard work. Just because you declare something doesn't mean it will happen. But your declaration opens up the door to kicking this junk off of your topography and you now walking and working your land for your future. I would say to those of you who, well, you know, this such and such disease is just part of our genetics. What is your name? Legion. What is your name? Oh, heart disease. Rise up 
and pray and declare God's best over your territory because sometimes things become a part of our family genetics because they clung on and nobody kicked them out. Let me give you this one. This will this will blow your mind. <sighs> Spirits are most often accompanied by medical maladies. Almost every time you read of a biblical occurrence of impure spirits or demons, there is a medical manifestation to what is going on. When you read down through the course of people having been possessed and Jesus dealing with them or being oppressed, uh, there's this uh, Old Testament, Saul, I mean, they think something medically is wrong with him, but he's just tormented and agitated, and it's a spirit. We read about the man who was mute. He could not talk. Can you imagine the doctors trying to figure this out? Where does a demon show up on the litmus test? Where does a demon show up on the medical analysis? Oh, we just, um, we're not sure. We can't figure this out. Why? There's no medical reason why he should not be able to speak. And yet the Bible says there was a mute spirit had come upon him. We read about, the, Bi the Bible says, an afflicting spirit caused one woman to be ill. Uh, blindness, muteness, seizures, um, crippled back of an older lady. She didn't break a vertebrae. She didn't uh, twist herself and fall over. There was no healing required. The Bible said she was bent over because of the oppression of a spirit. Mute, deaf, deception. I could go into the deception one. There's a lot of medical things going on these days that we're prescribing all kinds of medicine for that is just Deceive, deceit that's lodged its way into the psyche of our culture. Can I lean into that just for a second? There's a fascinating, everything in the first three chapters of the Bible is contested heavily. That God created the heavens and the earth, that's contested in about the ninth grade. It's an all-out attack on your, your children. Not from every teacher, but from, from the world that we live in. Because if you can disrep disrepute Genesis 1-1, God, then everything that comes after it can be disreputed. The fact that God would create them male and female, that's under attack. Why? It has little to do with our, our, our society. It has everything to do with undercutting who God is and how he's created us. Because to bombard truth and establish lies as truth is to tear away the very fabric of everything in the word of God. No question that people struggle with self-identity. No question that people struggle with who am I and what am I supposed to be. But when we start suggesting things to children, there's a problem. There is a serious problem. You know, I was telling Eldon that he dropped his Cheeto over the railing at our house, and we have a creek down below our house. We were talking about sharks. I was telling him that maybe sharks live down in the creek. <laughs> that I had heard of a shark called Cheaty Weedy that eats Cheetos because it'll be gone tomorrow. We don't have to get it because the shark might walk up and eat the Cheeto. Now, you're appalled that I would suggest this, And yet I can assure you by the end of the conversation, I had to really encourage my grandson that there were no sharks in that creek. <laughs> Even though he told me they don't live in creeks, they live in the ocean, but by the end of the discussion, he was concerned. <laughs> and being constantly bombarded with suggestive material to a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old is demonic. Yeah, yeah. The Bible says that that people have bought into the doctrine of demons. It's lies from the enemy that people are so convinced about. You and I, we're not going to do a whole lot of discussion to win that argument. We need to carry the presence of God and the power of God in our lives so that when people are entangled in that stuff, that we can pray with them and they can see the truth of God. Amen? Amen. I've got to stop. I got to stop. There's a lot more. I'm supposed to also make an announcement at the beginning of my message. Um, some of you will know that the carpet, when it was initially installed, was installed wrong. And so the carpet layers are coming to lay carpet. 
the new carpet in the morning. And so we're gonna ask right after gathering if some of you will stay and help us to move everything out of the classrooms and the lobby into here. Be a team in here stacking everything up. Because then on Monday night, we gotta move everything in here out back out to there so they can do out there. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna come back in and reset everything. Uh, I forgot to announce that. So if you'll hang out, see Josh, see myself, we'll get that taken care of. Do me a favor, stand with me. Let me give you, can you throw up the very last verse that I had? Dave, I th- we'll end on this. I love this portion of scripture. No, read this with me. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Come on, say it with me. No weapon that is formed against me will prosper. This is the heritage of servants of the Lord. No weapon formed against me shall prosper because I carried the presence of God. When I stepped down out of the boat onto the soil of God's kingdom, the demonic that would come to destroy me has to bow down to the presence of God that's part of my life, amen? Amen. You are gonna make it to the best future. You are gonna overcome the wrestling of the wicked one. You are gonna rise up and defeat him, why? Because the spirit of God lives within you because you've said yes to him living there. You've surrendered your life to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. I thank you, God, that we don't have to lay in bed afraid of the devil. We don't have to get freaked out if there was dialogue about demons. It's, they all submit themselves. Lord, I thank you for that one, one scripture that says, you cast demons out with a word, just a single word, go. And they had to obey because they're at your feet and therefore are at our feet. Lord, I pray that you will give us discernment. Give us wisdom. Help us to see truth. Help us to walk in that truth. While spirits and demons are very real, and while they will try to take territory, at the same time, God, we know that your spirit within us is greater. No weapon formed against me will prosper. I'll walk in your goodness. I'll travel through even the valley of the shadow of death, but I'll travel through because you are good and you are my God. We pray these things in Jesus' name that everyone said, Amen and amen. Let's sing. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, leaders, and what we do at C3 Church, visit our website at c3swwa.com.